Good to see how many people want to, you know, know more about my CD uh, backstory. So, <laughs> and Father James's. Um, no, it's wonderful to have you all here tonight at our second uh, of the Sunday night sessions. The first one was wonderful. A good time with Andy Squires, musician. Uh, tonight we have guest uh, Father James Bozeman, an Orthodox priest uh, from Beaufort, South Carolina. We'll, we'll find out a little bit more about him. And uh, the plan tonight is we're going to have. Uh, a conversation. So we're going to watch a little bit of a documentary about Father James's band, a band that he still plays in, uh, just to get a little taste of, of, of his life. Um, and then we're going to talk about our own stories uh, that took us, you know, kind of uh, from sort of being punk kids to now being priests um, at different churches and different traditions. So uh, it should be an interesting, interesting conversation. We'll see where it goes. It's, you know, choose your own adventure. Yeah, it'll be good. Uh, but uh, a couple of quick notes. Um, number one, thank you all just for showing up. This is wonderful to have uh, so many of you here. Um, uh, and uh, thank you to the Elgin Eight for making wonderful food uh, and for, the, for, the, for all the beverages. Uh, if you feel inclined, if you didn't already um, donate, there's, uh, there are QR codes at the bar and at the table there, and that's a way to donate. If you, don't, if you can't, don't worry about it. Just enjoy being here, that's fine. If you have the means, please do donate to help offset those costs, that'd be great. Uh, and secondly, um, we, we're going to talk for a while, there'll be a couple of videos, and then there'll be a time for question and answer, and so uh, please feel free to, to speak up and ask questions. So uh, I'm looking for your, some people to, to, to be brave and ask questions when we get to that point. Finally, uh, when the bells ring at 7 p.m., if you have kids at Cramer Hall, they're going to get abandoned at 7. So <laughs> you get over to Cramer Hall as quick as you can uh, once the bells ring. Uh, we'll be done before then. So, uh, on that note, I think we, uh, I'm going to start with just a clip uh, of the documentary called Parallel Love. It's about uh, Father James's band Luxury. He doesn't like watching it, so he's sitting really far over in the corner. Um, I'm just going to do the first four minutes. You get a little bit of a sense of this sort of strange pairing of, of rock music uh, and Orthodox priesthood in his case. So, here is the beginning. Uh, we'll, we'll, yeah, I think it's dim enough here. If someone wants to be the light dimmer, we can dim a little bit in this one. Okay. And, uh, and then we'll start talking after that. anywhere in a cassock and you're getting looks uh, because they don't know who you are, what you are, um, if you're safe or not, especially as an Orthodox priest in a small southern town in Texas. You feel that it's palpable when people look at you. It's a tension in my life. There's times I don't wear it because I just don't want to be looked at if I'm going to go to the post office or whatever, but there's plenty of times where I do wear it because I do want to be looked at. show I've ever seen. I was 
shocked just how untamed and wild that band was. I feel like Luxury, did they break up? Like, how does such a great band come from such a small place? Art should be disruptive, right? Wow, that is louder and noisier and harder than most of what I listen to, but oh, wow. No one should be singing this prettily over guitars that are lunging at me this way. And he would stare people down in the crowd and they'd come to me, and I'm like, I know this guy though, but you're looking through me, man. It's like, this is ridiculous. Why didn't Luxury make it? Did the Christians kill him? <laughs> Stop it there. So, <laughs> wow. yeah. So that's a little bit of a. Uh, so, uh, well, we're gonna try to use microphones. We'll see if that if we need them or not. But um, actually, I'm gonna open check. this up because that's uglier than. That's so normal. Check. Check, check one two. Check, check. Yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, you can put the lights back on if that's all right for our lighting person over there. Thank you very much. Um, so, so that's a bit of luxury, Father James's band. Um, so let's let I'm interested in the beginning. You all started in Georgia. How old were you when you started this this band? Well, first of all, I never do this. I never talk about luxury. So let's let's just go be awkward. <laughs> we'll talk about God eventually. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'm not about that. Word. I'm actually not that weird. I watch this. I'm just like nervous just yeah. thinking about yeah. this. Um, we were we all the movie. Will if you ever watch the movie, you can watch it. It's online. Um, just look at the old tale. In a nutshell, if I get going too long, stop me. Sounds good. I have other um, questions. I'll interrupt you. Good. We were, um, I ended up in Toccoa Falls College in uh, Northeast Georgia, in Toccoa, Georgia. Uh, the drummer, the guy who would become the drummer was there already. Our eventual bass player, my brother, who was a singer, um, all ended up at this college. And I was, I got there when I was 17 and met my wife at the same time. Um, we started, what became luxury started around 1990, so we're probably you know 19, 20 years old at the time, something like that. Um, so we were relatively, relatively young. We were already playing some, so that's about when it happened. Nothing. Yes. So what what bands? What band did you like? What did you start? <coughs> who did you want to be? Well, when I started, my tastes were were okay. Um, I was really into like a lot of the stuff in the 80s. So U2 was way up there. Yeah. Psychedelic Furs, REM, mm -hmm. a lot of like new wave stuff. I still love. Um, the rest, later on, the band as a, as a whole, my brother, you saw it at the very beginning, you were perceptive, he was really into the, a band called The Smiths. If anybody knows who The Smiths are, we were all kind of into them. Um, but we also were really into, like, <clears throat> into the punk rock scene, particularly what was called the, the Washington DC punk scene with the Discord records and all that going on. Fugazi. Fugazi, Shutter the King, mm -hmm. Lungfish, all these kind of artsy, more politically driven bands, um, although we weren't really like that. So we're really into that stuff. They were all straight edge bands, so like they didn't drink, they didn't smoke, they didn't do these things. We thought that fit in with our ethos. You know, we're at a Christian college, trying to figure out like what it meant to be Christian when you're making rock, you know, or punk, really, is what it was. So. Yeah. And I mean, what what is punk? I mean, some people know what punk is. You no, know, you were you were a punk. I know. Guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's. I mean, so I think. So I think that what we'll get to eventually, I think, is that. There's some connective tissue, yeah. right? Right. But like, when you were 20, what was it? What was being punk? Do you think? Well, gosh, it was anything that wasn't well. Well, like I should talk. To you. You know, if there's somebody to talk to, I suppose. I mean, yeah. really, like if you were into like the one kind of punk, like nobody else was punk enough for you. So right. if you were a, a fan of like DC punk, like anybody who's into anything less, you know. You charge more than five dollars for your. There you concert. go. That's exactly. Yeah. Really, but you know. <laughs> We got in trouble a lot of times because we would do, we would 
as a side note, we tour with other bands. We had this mentality of like, keep everything really cheap. And other bands hated that. And they were so <laughs> mad at us. You're selling your t-shirts for 10 bucks. We're selling ours for 20 bucks. Like, well, it's your problem, not our problem. Yeah, Taylor Swift sells hers for like 70 now. Yeah, there so. you go. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't make any money. We were the right ones to get anyway. So yeah, I mean, punk was, punk for us was, it was more, it was less about, it was, it was, there was a message to it. There was an art to it. Um, and so it had to like excel on some level, but still, it was abrasive, it was loud, you know, it was angular, it wasn't predictable was the idea, at least early on. Yeah. So like the world I grew up in, so the first concert I went to, it's not very, it's not very DC punk, oh. I'll, tell, I'll tell you, but it was MXPX. Oh yeah. yeah. And it was like in sixth grade, yeah. and, and to me that was like, my mind was yeah. blown. I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to be in a band, I want to be in that band. Um, yeah. And then we started a band that sounded just like that. Yeah. And we got pretty good, but we were like 14, so no one knew who we were. So <laughs> there's worse things to start off with. It could have been worse. Yeah, yeah you know, I mean, my taste, you know, you, you know grew eventually, uh, hopefully. But, 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 uh, and then, but eventually, uh, you know, a couple things in the documentary. First, I think you, it, there's a section there where you go to Cornerstone, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I, eventually, I was in other bands and some metal band. Um, and then, uh, and then, sort of an emo band, and that band went to Cornerstone, mm -hmm. and, and and so for those who don't know, Cornerstone was there in in the '90s and the early 2000s. There was a real sort of thriving underground punk hardcore scene that was in like exclusively in the Christian world, in the sort of evangelical Christian world mainly, I'd say. Yeah. Um, uh, these are see the bands, their CDs would get sold at. Christian bookstores or by like distribution companies that would only have them at concerts uh, at these other little punk concerts at churches. Churches would like open their hall and there'd be like a weird crazy concert and there'd be mosh pits and like people jumping off the you know the ceiling and and uh, and that's what I grew up going to. I grew up going to those and Cornerstone is like summer camp for mm -hmm. Christian punk kids uh, hoping they're gonna get signed to Tooth and Nail Records, right? Yes, that's right. That's exactly, that's exactly it. Yeah. And you did that. We did. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for better or worse. For better or for worse. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's well, we're here. We're we're where we are now. So maybe for better. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Yep. That's the conjecture even to this day. Yeah. But it was a strange time, and so yeah. I think uh, so. That's the thing to think about. Like when we think, I think mainstream. When we think punk. You think you imagine kids that like uh, hate God and are complete anarchists, and there certainly were plenty of those. Uh, but then there's also a weird sort of there's the straight edge punk kids. And then there was the Christian punk kids, and then you know there was the vegan punk kids. You know, there's all these different sort of <laughs> types of, you know. And they were the thing about it. So it punk and hardcore. The thing about it was was the two things that stick with me. And I've even thought I want to write an article about how I think it affects like my certainly affects my vision of of, of the, you know, my theology, but it also I think affects my teaching or my preaching yeah. uh, because punk is number one. You're you're, you're comfortable with highlighting the weird aspects of life, right? You're, you're not interested in what everyone thinks they're supposed to be doing, right. and you're saying, actually there's something more important over here in this weird little subculture. And then hardcore, to me, that, what that taught me was, was you actually have to believe in something, yeah. and even mm -hmm. if other people aren't on the same page, that's okay to be bold about this thing yeah. and be honest about it. Like, I was friends with those guys in NIV, and they had a song mm -hmm. called I Would Die Tonight for My Beliefs, and people would like jump on each other's backs and scream like, I would die tonight for my beliefs. <laughs> and like, no. like, where else does that happen? No. That's so no. weird. That's uh, so but it, but it's, there's a connection between like a serious faith and that sort of uh, uh, serious approach to, to life. What year was it, Cornerstone? When did you go? Uh, 2001 and yeah. 2002, yeah, I were think. There, that was the last two times really? I was Really? No yeah. way. Crazy. Well, I was there yeah. back in uh, 2011, but I was a deacon in the Orthodox Church. But you were. So wow. we manned one of the tables. We didn't actually perform. And we were in one of the tents, and I had my cassock on for two days or two and a half days. <laughs> and by the third day, none of us who were there could fit. It's, it's a thousand degrees there. It's yeah. just yeah. unbelievably hot. Yeah. And then you're in a tent. It's terrible. So yeah, oh my God. So we yeah. were there when we were there. That's Wild. Cool. Yeah. I don't remember any of the casts. Yeah. Uh, well, we were there for 2001 and 2002. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, all that. that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I guess that that's a good transition. Like when 
when did you encounter orthodoxy? So you weren't, you weren't born orthodox. No. You were a Christian. No. Uh, you, as you, were you guys raised a serious Christian yes. at home? Yes. I can, I can go off on this for a bit if you want. That's okay. We got to, yeah, could take a few minutes. So, okay. So my brother and I, my brother is Father David Bozeman now. He's a priest in the Orthodox Church. Three of us in the band became Orthodox priests. That's why the movie got made. Was, it was such a weird thing. Um, <laughs> it's a weird thing. Now, actually, a, a fourth person who was connected to our accident is now an Orthodox priest. So it's very interesting how this has happened. Um, my brother and I were raised in an evangelical Christian home. My father was, for a long time, a, a pastor in the Christian Missionary Alliance Church, which is an offshoot of the Presbyterian Church. And there's a lot of them uh, up north, Pennsylvania, Florida, which is the north thing in the south, um, <laughs> as you all know. Um, we, I, I grew up in that. I had no clue. For me, as an evangelical in that, in that circle, anybody who was not one of us was, one thing was going to hell for sure, especially Roman Catholics, they were definitely going to hell. <laughs> uh, we knew that for sure. So, Too many pictures of Mary. Right? Yeah, seriously, yeah. There's a, you know, yeah. how, can it, how can you possibly be a Christian? Um, in, fast forward to college, um, this is convoluted. I'll try to not be going on and on about this. When we were in college together, all of us, this whole band, this whole group, um, of course, when you're in college, you're experimenting, you're thinking about things, doing things differently. And the college we were going to was an evangelical college, very conservative. If you wore jeans, you had to wear a collared shirt with the jeans, you know, so it was like, the first day I was in trouble, like right away, I was wearing a Depeche Mode t-shirt, the jeans to class, like, you can't, what, what is this? Yes. Sickness. <laughs> so, very conservative. <laughs> What ended up happening was um, Father Chris Foley, who is in the movie, who is really the first one of us to kind of discover orthodoxy. Um, he was a part of a, of, a, of, a, of a charismatic worship church, if you're familiar with that terminology. And they were really getting pretty wild in terms of worship. Like they were, like this was new, but they were bringing rock bands into worship. This was very unknown at the time in the early 90s. But then a group of them heard about this thing called liturgical worship. Like this, this was like a new terminology. What, what is this liturgical yeah. worship? And so they started delving into this and discovering things like you know liturgical worship, you know, icons, censers, uh, chanting, and, and that sort of thing. Things that were much more traditional that we many of us would be familiar with. They started a church basically based on this idea. They got kind of kicked out of the charismatic church they were in because they're like, you guys are too weird for us. Like, this is really weird. <laughs> so they started this church. And it was kind of a homemade thing. Um, they were pulling things in from the Anglican tradition, from the Catholic tradition. Um, things that they liked, they would just blend into their services. They were just making things up. But over time, they started discovering something they heard about. Like, this, what is this Orthodox church? Like, this is something new. Let's look at that. And they started digging into it and, and found, you know, sort of this Orthodox tradition. And so they just did the same thing. They said, well, I see there's an Orthodox church. Let's just make our own. But you can't do it. It doesn't work, actually. But they did it anyway. And so they started reading about Orthodoxy. They had their sort of non, we would call it non-canonical Orthodox group. Um, and they would start, they would just, they just made this church up. So over time, um, as they were getting involved with this, my brother got involved with it. And I was like, this is this is nuts. Like, you guys, again, like, icons? What are icons? You know, you, you can't, what is this? Uh, what is this whole thing about priests? You know, this is wrong, this is wrong. So I was very, very opposed to it. But as they went along, this is in the mid-90s, they were really digging in, digging in, and realizing kind of the limitations of what they were doing, which ultimately, in the long run, led them to what we would call the canonical Orthodox Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and I really, I didn't like any of it. I just thought it was the craziest thing. And I was very much opposed to it. They eventually, this group, which was in Toccoa, Georgia, eventually said, we've, we've got to become a part of the proper Orthodox Church. We're just sort of a fly-by-night group. So they contacted um, one of the local Orthodox churches in the area and said, hey, we want to become Orthodox. And of course, the priest's like, really? Okay. <laughs> so the whole church ends up becoming part of the Orthodox Church, properly speaking, the right way. And they come in individually as individuals, but the whole church basically came in. I still had nothing to do with this. Um, but finally, after many, many years of being resistant to it, and then eventually really seeing how my friends who had become Eastern Orthodox and really were digging into their faith in Christ, how much they were changing, I was like, 
can't, I can't ignore this. So then I started doing what they did, and I started thinking, well, why don't we, at my church, because at this point I was at a Christian Missionary Alliance church, I was 30 years old and an elder in the church, it was kind of weird. Um, <laughs> I was a worship leader, I had a guitar, and, and everybody's like, let's make this louder. I was like, let's make it quieter. Because yeah. I was learning about orthodoxy and orthodox worship, um, which is a cappella and much more kind of chant oriented. And um, just eventually, I was just so convicted, I had to at least go to an orthodox service to see what it was about, um, that I went one Saturday night for Great Vespers, which we do on Saturday evenings, and I walked into our little church in Kakoa. Um, as I tell my folks, I've heard this story a thousand times, so I heard it recently. It was a little mission church in a little old former Army Navy surplus store. It wasn't very beautiful. You walk in, the tired priest was doing the service. We have a cappella choir. They were terrible. <laughs> They're still new. They were new because they were coming into the canonical church. The church was kind of a mess. It wasn't properly set up. They'd gone through some trouble. Um, but in God's providence, by halfway through the service, I was like, I, I've got to become this. Like, I had no idea that that was what's going to happen. I thought I'd come and get some good ideas to kind of take back to my church. Right. And instead, I was like, I, this is, I need this. And so I became, I, we decided that we were going to follow this path. I went home and told my pastor, who I love, still love to this day, and said, look, we, we got to go. I've got to leave. And we left and we came to the Orthodox Church, and that was in 2004, and we haven't turned back. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. I, I, had a, I had someone. It's weird. It is weird, yeah. <laughs> I had a similar story. So I, I, I grew up uh, charismatic, evangelical, sort of, and, um, and that was all I knew. I knew sort of like praise band and yep. then long sermons, and, um, <laughs> and which, you know. Which we resist with all our might here at St. John's. And the St. James and the Duke of But um, <laughs> but I, I had no, I had zero concept of liturgy at all, like n nothing. And then, but uh, when I started touring more, that's when I got a chance. Like back then, we didn't have iPhones. I was still touring before iPhones were everywhere. Yeah. And so I read because I was it was either that or like a Game Boy, and I wasn't into video games. So uh, so I read books and. Slowly, you know, started reading. I read Christian books for whatever reason. I started to slowly get, you know, I'd read Thomas Burton, and then I'd read C.S. Lewis, and slow, slowly get into things were a bit deeper and, and, and uh, more serious. And I encounter references to liturgical worship. And I was like, what, what even yeah. is this? I have no concept. Um, and so finally, I read enough of it. And one time, I, I went to there was a, a, a Benedictine a Roman Catholic monastery near me, and I was like, well, I just need to go and see what's what's going on here. And I went, and I actually went into the gift shop before before <laughs> mass, and I talked to the lady at the gift shop, and I said, like, what do I do? And, and she said, just stand when they stand, and kneel when they kneel, uh, you'll be okay. And I said, okay. And, and then she said, I, well, I told her, I've been reading the Fathers, and I'm, you know, I'm kind of interested. Uh, and then she told me, she said, just so you know, there's no going back. And I was like, what a weird thing to say. And it's been absolutely true, you know? It's, so, so I experienced it was, it was terrible liturgy, it was terrible chanting by like 10, you know, old, you know, Benedictine guys. And immediately I was like, this is it. Because to me it felt freeing. And, uh, and you know, the charismatic thing was always so subjective about like, am I feeling the spirit at the moment? And this is just, you get to give yourself over and go along and, and have a real sense of the, the unity of the body of Christ. Uh, and so, um, yeah. That's Thank awesome. I, wonder, that. I, was, I was curious. I was yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah. But it's interesting how that can hit yeah. you when you yeah. have no con concept mm -hmm. of it. And how sometimes, now that we're used to it, we take it for granted, totally. right? So, totally. yeah. yeah. It's the exact same thing. All the time. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's a connection also between liturgy and music. I mean, literally one of the, like, those, like, I think one of the, one of the most boring things in the world is to be at a long band practice with a <laughs> bass player because you're like, I don't have much to play yeah. and I'm playing the same song over and over again, right? You know, so there, but uh, but but then you so, so there and, and then even concerts, right? Like a yeah. concert, you're like, it seems like it should be the most, you know, if you're a charismatic, it yeah. should be the most ecstatic thing every yeah. time, but of course it's not, right? You know, you're doing the same songs every night, day after day, and and so there is this, to me, there's a sort of Liturgical aspect that you're you, you know what you're showing up for you're gonna you're gonna offer it uh, and 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 you know together you're offering something and uh, you're becoming part of something larger than, than yourself which is a cheesy thing to say but it's true 
Uh, but I don't know, how, can you relate to that? Yeah, I mean, oh, I was gonna say something earlier too, maybe it relates to it too. When, I, when, when we started our, our mission in, in Buford, everything, this is a side note, so I'll come back to this point. Yeah, right. But it, there was a clip, <clears throat> mind you, this movie is actually kind of old now, so like I went through four hairstyles in the movie. So <laughs> you watch it. You had mine for a minute. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I, I, love, I love that when my wife made me cut it off, so she was kind of long hair. Um, we were, we'd have to set up every Sunday, so I, I always would say, you know, we'd have to set up our church. We were meeting in a, um, an armory uh, in downtown Buford, and it's a beautiful space to be in, but there's just like 12 of us in it, this giant room. But we'd have to set everything up and tear it down every week. And so, I mean, like everything I needed to start doing a church like that, I learned from punk rock. It's like, you know, <laughs> making flyers Let by it. hand, yeah. you know, moving things around, <laughs> building stuff for yourself, that kind of thing. Anyway, but your point about liturgy, yeah, I, you know, it's funny because when you're playing, which I haven't done a whole lot of the last you know, 10, 12 years, um, when you're playing shows, as you would know, you know, you get into a mode, you know, like you, your hands know what to do. Yeah. Particularly for me, uh, I would say this, I, I've been in two bands that were, I mean, you've been in multiple ones, obviously. I've been in a couple of bands, and two that were signed and were putting out records. The second of which, um, never got a movie made about it, but the <laughs> bass player from that band was in the movie. Um, and I was the singer, mm -hmm. so it was a little bit more going on for me. Like, I couldn't kind of go totally on autopilot, but I found that oftentimes you do. You, you play, you, as we say in our church, when people come to our church and they want to become orthodox, and they say, what do we do? And I say, well, you're going to do the thing. And the thing for us is coming in, we venerate icons, we light candles, um, you stand when people stand, you sit when they sit, right. you know, we do a lot more standing. Yeah. Um, you, if people prostrate or kneel, you do that when they do that. Um, if you come to the priest to get a blessing, come to the, you know, if they're doing it, you follow them. So doing the thing, learning to do the thing, in a sense, I think, in, in, in playing, you know, you're playing, your hands are just doing what your hands are gonna do. They're used to playing these songs, they're used to changing the chords, when you change the chords. And you, in a, I think in a beautiful way, kind of get lost in the music, in a sense. In a good way, not lost, like you can't find your way around, mm -hmm. but the music sort of carries you through. Yeah. I was talking about this morning at Liturgy. Um, we had a couple of kids just, thank you Josh, by the way, for helping out this morning. Um, <laughs> no, Josh is in the back. We had a couple of kids just scream their guts out in a small space. <laughs> and normally it doesn't affect me, but I, I kept finding myself getting lost, like getting, getting distracted. And the one thing about the Divine Liturgy is it's, it's complicated, for one thing. And, but it, it's a thing that if you, I mean, allowing for just the practice of doing it, and I think this applies to the whole Christian life, the practice of doing the thing, day, day in and out, whether you feel like doing it or not, um, tends to carry you through. So in music, you know, you go to play the show, you practice, like you said, you rehearse. Mm -hmm. Rehearsals are boring. Mm -hmm. For the bass player especially, yeah. I don't know if Father Chris talked about yeah. that. He's just so bored. Can we move on? Yeah. Um, no, we really got to work out this guitar part, yeah. you know? Just sit over there and drink your Coke while we work on this. Um, but it's it, the boring part of it, really, too. That's part of the whole picture. It is. It's learning so that when you get up to play, your hands know where to go, and you're free to kind of just enter into the music. So, I mean, it's, I know yeah, when you talk about the liturgy, I think there's that quality to that yeah. statement. Absolutely. Is that a good answer? That, that was great. Yeah, yeah. good job. <laughs> Um, and the other, I mean, the other thing I think about is, is, I don't know, how much touring did you guys do once being we, ordained? Did you do any, or being no. orthodox even? Did you well, do any after orthodox? we did very little period because we yeah. were just getting ready for things to take off. We had booked all these dates. We were looking forward to the future. We were looking even towards showcasing for major labels yeah. and then the accident happened and that right. short circuit everything. So we yeah. did very, very little touring, lots of short dates, like yeah. short runs. Then after that, with the second band, we tried to go move forward with that, but I was starting to have kids. Yep. And when I was moving into orthodoxy, it was taking over, you yeah. know? I didn't know what was going on with me. I was like, what's happening? Oh, you're becoming orthodox. You, you're gonna be a priest someday. Really? No, it's never gonna happen, because I don't wanna do that. That's <laughs> crazy. I said that a lot of times, by the way. We need to get to that eventually, yeah. actually, yeah, yeah. I, so, I mean, I guess, so for me, I guess for me, I did about, since that moment of, of revelation at the, at, bad chanting at the Benedictine Monastery. Um, I had about maybe probably close to 10 years of touring after that. Or like you played eight. some cool shows. Yeah, some cool shows. <laughs> you too. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, but, but like tour is, is its own weird thing, right? I mean, and there's a lot of monotony and um, there's a lot of downtime. It, it's, there's certainly moments of like 
that it's fun and incredible and adventurous. Other times it's just so yeah. monotonous. Uh, and and the other weird thing, eventually for me, the thing that eventually led me to, to joining, uh, you know, becoming an Anglican, although it had a sort of windy route, um, was, you know, going on tour. I was a Christian, right? And so I, I knew I needed to. What, what a thing a Christian does is they show up to worship God on Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, and at my own church at home, the music was so bad. Then I was like, it was a rock band worship, and I was like, my band's better than this. <laughs> and, and so I, I would, I'd show up after, yeah. after they would play and hear a long, nice sermon, and that was good. But once you're on tour, where do you go find your good pastor whose long, nice sermons you like listening to, where you can know exactly the right time to get there to skip out on the terrible music? Uh, it, it doesn't work, right? And so I was looking for consistency and sort of groundedness, and like, and eventually, it was liturgy was a sort of revelation in that. And then, and then beyond that, what's actually going to get me up at 8 a.m. when we have to leave at 9:30 when we were up until 3 a.m. the night before? It's not necessarily uh, because the church is pretty or hearing uh, this person's great sermon who I've never, who I have no idea who they are. It eventually, it was the revelation of the sacramental life of, that I'm going to come here and and receive uh, God's grace given to me uh, in the sacrament. Right. So that to me, that was a whole. Yeah. That was the thing eventually that that kept me grounded and and made me a continual churchgoer when I was on, on uh, you know on the road. And then eventually, that became I became a sort of serial churchgoer, and I would like wait to I could I could get out of sound check so I could run and find out this new church. And then eventually, I had to ask myself, why am I so obsessed with <laughs> churches? And uh, here I am. So that that, that was awesome. that was the long term thing with that. But um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Much respect for that. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> I never had to go through that. Right, right, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of bad churches I went to too. So yeah, so that makes me grateful for where we are. Um, let me see. I have I have one more. Uh, actually, no. Let's you know. I have I have, I have let, let's move into our theological mm -hmm. section, and I'm going to do that by showing a clip from another Eastern Orthodox musician, uh, Arvo Pert. So this is a clip. This is my favorite clip ever of anyone talking about music and faith. And so it has almost nothing to do with what we're talking about, but I just have to show it because it's so good, and I have a captive audience. <laughs> to deal with it, and hopefully it'll give us something to talk about, and so, uh, here you go. Uh, we will switch over, and this is, this is so this is Bjork, who's an Icelandic musician, interviewing Arvo Perk sometime in the 90s, so the footage is grainy, but what I want you to listen to, uh, listen for, is, is, um, is, is how Bjork sees in Arvo Perk's music uh, a theological reality that isn't articulated. So, uh, so that, that, we'll listen to that and then we'll, then we'll talk a bit about, about theology. And hopefully it's loud enough, we'll see. I like your music very, very much because you give space to the listener. He can go inside and live there. But a lot of music from last few centuries, you just have to sit and listen. I, uh, maybe it is because uh, I, 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 I need uh, space for myself, <laughs> <laughs> even if I, I am working. I think the sound is, is, is a very interesting phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You can... Uh, why the people like and are so influenced of music? They don't know how strong the music influence us, mm -hmm. good or bad. Mm -hmm. If it is, you can kill people with, with sound. Mm -hmm. And if you can kill, then you can, maybe there is also the sound, which is something opposite of killing. Yeah. And the, distance between these two points mm -hmm. is very big yeah and you are free you can choose in in art everything is possible but everything what is made is not necessary there is a question and answer 
answer the different voices inside your music. It's almost like um, like Pinocchio and the little cricket who and and so one is is like um, human and always doing mistake or pain or or or, or making pain to other and the little cricket is is more like um, uh, comfort him or 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 tell him you know do you feel it is inside your music or maybe I imagine I'm very happy about the, that you talk about it it's really so and the my uh, uh, this new style it consists uh, two two ways two sides so that one line is my sins and another line is forgiveness okay. to these sins. Mostly the music is, has two voices. One is more complicated and subjective, mm -hmm. but another is very simple, clear and objective but Pinocchio is a good thing <laughs> <laughs> If you haven't listened to our book pair, go home and listen to our book pair and Bjork. But that something about that just yeah, it's awesome. I, I've watched this clip like a million times and cried several of them just because I think like the fact that she gets she gets the gospel almost from listening to his music. Like, how's that even possible? That's just unbelievable, right? So, yeah, yeah. the the potential. I mean, uh, the potential for music is to do good or do evil, yeah. or any number of things in between. Like you said, you know, to kill or do the opposite, you yeah, know, of killing, you know, yeah. to make a lie, you yeah. know, yeah. and you know, you know, when you've experienced something in music that's making you alive. There's, and it's not just about feelings. There's something happening to you. Sometimes you don't even know. You couldn't even, you know, you can't even put your finger on it. I've been to concerts um, where I shouldn't have been as moved as I was, <clears throat> not just emotionally, but there was something in it that spoke of heaven, like where the guitar is doing this of all things, you know, right. people playing rock and roll and like, you're like, wow, this is, there's something happening here mm -hmm. that truly is transformative. I mean, it's just, and his music is incredible too. Yeah. It's simple, like just, like how does he do that with like yeah. four notes, like, and they're so slow and quiet, but yeah. it's amazing. I also just love her face when, she, yes. when he says, <laughs> the first one is my sins, and she goes, what? What, yeah. <laughs> what? What are you talking about? Be, yeah. And then forgiveness, the other yeah. one is God's grace, That's you beautiful. know, coming, yeah. So thank you for letting me inflict that upon you. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, but I think that, I mean, that is really, to me, it's music uh, has a sacramental possibility, right? I mean, we, we, live, uh, we live in a world that God has made. We live in a world that's fallen, but uh, it's a world that God um, has redeemed, uh, is redeeming by the incarnation, right? And and, and through his spirit and through the church. And so because of that, the material world can become uh, an opportunity of, of participation in God's life. Right? It mu and must. And it must. Has to. Yeah. What, what other way is there? Yeah. You know? yeah. He makes the world to save us. That's the whole thing. Yeah. That's what Martha tells us. Yeah. Fourth of us. The sec the se yeah, I love that. Uh, the, the section at the end uh, of, of, you should watch the documentary. The whole thing is interesting. And there's, there's a lot, some interesting Backstory: as Father, as Father James mentioned, there was a, a, car, a serious car accident where several of them almost died, um, and then that sort of changed the trajectory of, of, of your lives, I think. Um, but at the end, there's there's a wonderful section of you guys sort of trying to make another album uh, and now as priests, but also thinking about music in this different way and thinking about about uh, about these realities, right? That that. That you're not you're not trying to just be in a big famous band and you know like trying to impress people. You're trying to um, do something good and valuable that you also love and that's fun and like nothing's yeah. wrong. That's all great. Uh, uh, but but there is a sort of there's a seriousness to it that maybe you weren't as aware of when you were 20 or something, huh? And, and Father Chris talk, says a bit about that, but what, what do you, what's your, 
how's that experience? And what's your experience with like thinking about music as as you know as a priest now and and as a, you know as an older yeah. it's, sorry, you're not old. No, but no, like, no I'm getting there. You know, but I just mean you know you're not neither of us are twenty anymore, yeah. so it's a different world. Yeah. Fifty two, but it's getting old all the time. It's a long way from rock and roll there. Fifty two is like my twenties. Right. I still feel like I'm twenty. Rolling Stones are going back on tour though. So. Like <laughs> How old are they now? I mean really amazing since Birch of All. Um they're mostly all still alive. Yeah. Um uh, you know, I remember when um, when you asked me before a question related to this too. When I had I'd become Orthodox, <clears throat> I had converted, I had been received into the Orthodox Church, and the other band I was in was we were we were playing shows, and as you know, like we weren't really touring so much, but when you play, it often it's going to be a Saturday night, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So in the Orthodox Church, at least, we have a, a vesper service on Saturday night which is connected to Sunday morning with Divine Liturgy. It's all one cycle. And all Orthodox Christians should try to go to Vespers regularly. I've only got a few of you here, so I can say that. <laughs> um, so I was going, you know, I'd go every Saturday night, and then we'd have a, a show scheduled at some punk dive, you know, nearby or something. And I remember, I remember like standing in, in the service, and you know, it's, by then the, the little church had gotten much more beautiful in terms of what we we're doing. And I was just kind of like, and here we were singing these beautiful Vesperal hymns, um, and I'm thinking, I've got to drive like an hour to some pa place painted black on the inside that smells like really old beer. <laughs> right. Talking to people, I'm happy to talk to them, but talking on a level that's, that's so low. Yeah. And I remember telling my priest, Father Jacob, Father Jacob Culp was my priest at the time, and I, and I talked to him about it, and I just said, I don't, I don't know how to deal with this dichotomy. Like, I want to keep doing music, but I'm an Orthodox Christian come to Vespers, then I have to leave here and go do this stuff. And he said, well, he said, and I always stuck with this, it's not really remarkable or anything. He said, well, just it's like, do good, do it well. You know, basically do it to the glory of God. Take this thing and offer it to the Lord. And for some reason, for whatever reason, that just kind of stuck with me. And that night I drove off and played at some, some punk dive in Clarksville, Georgia. It was terrible. <laughs> but the show was great that night because – it was just, it was, it was a lot, it was fun. I mean, there was a lot of people there, and it was the stuff that we were doing. But then all of a sudden, it was like, wait, this, this, even this, and this is the thing I've, I've really preached to my people, to the folks coming to our Orthodox Church when we make them into catechumens and they're looking at becoming Orthodox, is the potential for everything to become prayer. So, you know, everything must ultimately become prayer. It must become a way to encounter God. Like I said, every, the whole world is given to us for us to know God. You know, from our from the orthodox sacramental reality, God makes the world so that we can know Him. You know, we fall, sin happens, the devil comes in and tricks us. We find ourselves in sin. We have to repent. We have to return to God. But He gives us the things of this earth, and we would say in orthodoxy, we would say He gives us wheat, He gives us grapes, He gives us the sun to make these things happen, the rain. But then man has to take these things and break them and recombine them and make something new from them, offer them to Him so that He can bless them give them back to us, and then the mystery somehow save us through these things. That's how we looked at it as Orthodox. Um, in music, in some ways, it's, it's a similar thing. Mm -hmm. To take this very imperfect thing, you know, punk rock, you know, yeah. essentially, and then offer it up, you know, as priests of creation, as Father Chris talks about that in the movie, offering these things up and asking God, you know, take what's blessable here, return it, help me to be saved by it through the salvation that you've already worked out, and help me to be a light to the people around me at the same time. Um, I think that's where we're going with all this. Yeah. So yeah. And there's and there are I feel like in live shows there are times where that does break mm -hmm. through, right? And maybe some and I think even you know here's the mystery. Right? I think it even happens when people have no concept oh, yeah. of yeah. God's presence, yeah. right? Yeah. They've gone to some concert and they've just been overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And and but that's what it is. It's mm -hmm. that someone is is offering up this good, yeah. uh, and it's somehow becoming. Uh, you're be feeling joined in it, and God's grace is somehow pouring through that in some in some level, right? Recognizing it <laughs> with faith is important, and that's the saving element. But yeah. but the experience I think breaks through even even those uh, those places where people aren't aware. So. You're familiar with Sunday Day Real Estate, right? I am indeed. You, do you like Sunday Day Real Estate? I do. Okay, yeah. Very good. So like I think about them, this band yeah. from yep. Seattle, and their singer is sort of an on again, off again Christian of sorts. So at some point, mostly on again, I think most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeremy Judic. Really amazing songwriter. 
And, and I, I would say this too, particularly for those when people are coming from a Christian background, a lot of times people would, at, like at their shows, like that's one of those shows where you go, and there's just something about what he's doing and saying and how he's saying it that I believe is coming directly through his heart, where Christ has somehow done something, no matter how imperfect he's living or is, mm -hmm. that when he, when the, this is my experience. And this is actually the experience of some of the people I know around me going, man, there was something about that concert. Mm. Particularly for those of us, I think, who are Christians, at least have something in us that is in Christ, mm. that somehow Christ is able to work through that, and then those who are in the audience who are receptive to that possibility of that happening, yeah. that transformative nature of music, that there's something that just lifts you up. Now, maybe it's not deep theology. You know, maybe a lot of it's just feeling. And feeling can be, feelings are terrible, guys. <laughs> but, you know, you can still feel some of these things sometimes. Yeah. You have these remarkable moments. I mean, transcendent moments where you're like, whoa. Yeah. There's a feeling, there's a sensation here. I use words here. I don't always share that word. <laughs> um, but there's a sensation of something here that's that's more than just earthly. There's something heavenly about this. Yeah. Yeah. That's rock and roll. If nothing else, it's a, it's a moment where sort of like our hyper-individualized world yeah. recognizes that we actually were made to be members yeah. of something beyond, like members of something, of other people, which ultimately we know to be the body of Christ. Like we are actually made to be members of the body of Christ. And you just get an inkling of that in, those, in concerts, right? Or even in a football game, right? There's an inkling of the sense like, I'm participating in something and like it doesn't take away my individuality, but it but it magnifies my joy, right? And yeah. so that's that's the, the Christian vision of reality. One other aspect of concerts, maybe you could even speak to this. I don't know you could, because you have more experience even than I do in this regard. Um, it's just that sense of when you're when you're playing, and the connection with the people sometimes is so profound. You know, my brother. I, I tell people at church, my brother. Before we start a show, he has this incredible. I love my brother. He's my younger brother. He has this incredible power over people. It's dangerous. It's like you could really misuse this power. <laughs> and he would stare people down in the show. And his stare was like, my brother's like a wimpy guy, you know. But on stage, he transformed into something totally different. But he, would, he wouldn't start the show until people would move to the front. So sometimes you're in a bar and everybody's at the back. It's so boring. And so he'd say, we're not starting until you come up. And he would just stare at them. It's incredible. But when, I don't, it's an amazing power. Not everybody has it. I've tried it. It doesn't work. Um, but when the, when the people would gather and you begin to play and you're looking, you're the musician on the stage. You're lifted up a bit, but you're dependent on that connection with the people. And there, there's that liturgical aspect of, yeah. of being joined in an act, mind you, music. So maybe for you, I mean, I imagine you would have that same sensation when you were at some concerts, just some, something happens. Mm -hmm. And there's that connection with the people. Yep. I mean, it's really terrible when it's not there, but when it is there. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I, I, miss, I miss that part. Totally. No, it is good. Yeah. Actually, I have a whole uh, theory. Here, here it is. You can okay. tell me what you think. This will be, we, we can land here and then we can go to questions unless you have okay. something else. No, 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 no. I have this theory that, like, the priest is actually the bass player. <laughs> so, do elaborate. Okay. <laughs> Because, I mean... I'm glad you didn't say drummer. The point is, <laughs> you're in a central part of the action, right? You're sort of mm -hmm. leading th this, this movement, but you're always pointing beyond yourself, mm -hmm. right? You're pointing to the... Like, I'm, people weren't looking at me, right? Yeah. They are looking at the lead singer, yeah. right? And then you're a good thing. priest. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You're pointing to Jesus. Yeah. You're pointing to the cross. And so, the priest is the bass player. That's great. And I, and I, I think about that. That's very good. I think about the play Father Chris. People would walk up to him and look at me and say, you play bass. They would say, I don't think your amp's on. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm the bass player. If you don't hear you feel me, you don't hear me. They knew my amp was on. That's right. right. Yeah. Good for you. That's yeah. good. That's good. Father, do you have anything to add before we open it up to people? No. All right. Well, we'll. We'll uh, open it up for a bit to uh, questions and then uh, give you time to get a, a snack and a drink before you have to run and get your kids at seven. <laughs> so if you have them over there. Um, yeah, questions, yeah. Right. Speak loudly and I'll try to repeat things. Well, it's interesting that um, you speak here about bands, but before bands come instruments. Mm. Were you trained within <laughs>
you first, and then I'll, I'll go. Yeah. So are you guys about training, like actual technical training? Um, well, I, when I was a kid, I learned to play the trombone for about six months, but mostly I like to just, I like to just take it apart. <laughs> it I was no good at it. Um, <clears throat> I had some piano lessons. I, I think, I think, I don't know, I, I, for me, it was like, I liked rock music. So I see these guys and I have this dream of like, this is really cool, I want to do that. I had no idea what that really looked like. Um, when I graduated from high school, I bought my first guitar with a Fender Squire. It was one of those Jeff Lee's guitars. Yeah. Yep. It, was, it was cheap though. Yep. And I just sat down and learned just the major chords. And frankly, I've not learned anything new since then. <laughs> yes. A long time. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I guess you just kind of get into it. At least that was my experience. I'm not technically trained, I'm not a real musician. I just do what I do. Honestly, same. So I grew up in a, in a singularly unmusical fam family. We had, we had a grand piano. And we had the technology in the 90s where you put a floppy disk in and it would play itself. So that, was, that, was, that was the extent of our musical ability. And my mom tried to get me to do like the, the, the four-year-old violin thing, and it lasted like three days. Um, but with punk, I mean, punk rock, for all of its flaws and limitations, the great thing about it is you're like, I can do that. Like, you know, like, I can play three chords and... Power chords save me. Two fingers. Two fingers Anywhere and you can that. play anything. Yeah, like and, so, all. and so, I mean, for me, I, I eventually I just, once I saw that band, I was like, I want to do that. And my friend was like, well, you're the bass player because I'm playing guitar because he was cooler than I was. <laughs> and, but I got, you know, I, my mom took me to a garage sale and we found a guitar and a bass and like eventually a drum set and I just would play and That's then, awesome. then join with other people and that's the fun thing that you get to I always like when people think like I'm actually less a musician and more a member of a band I feel like yes you know because if I were to sit there and try to play a bass you'd all be like that's all you have you know <laughs> but uh, but I can play in a band really well right and so to me that's that was the joy in it being a part of a part of that group and making interesting music and uh, so anyhow but yeah that said I have a, I uh, have a lot of respect for those who train seriously and take their, their instruments seriously. And uh, I was forcing Henry to take piano lessons until COVID messed it up. And so hopefully we'll get him back in. Because I'm, I'm happy to force my kids against their will to learn piano. So that's <laughs> kind of the thing. I, would, I wish I'd played better, but yeah. Another question? In the back over there. Good question. I mean, so yes, as she was saying that we talked about sort of the power of music, but we didn't name it as as it being the Holy Spirit that was the power of moving the music. So I would say, I mean, here's my quick question, then you correct me, Father. Uh, I would say, my, or my quick answer, I would say ultimately, yes, whatever, like, like we were saying, even at a concert that's not a Christian concert, that whatever is making you feel connected to the sort of uh, the deeper aspects of life is is the Holy Spirit. The problem, I think, comes. It, I think both of us are probably a bit sensitive to this because we grew up Christian music adjacent, and then there in that world, there's a sort of like fence around the stuff that's definitely going to transmute the Holy Spirit to you on demand or something. And and I think there's a bit of a, a fear there that then. But then they end up monetizing it, and you're like, is the Holy Spirit moving, or is it just you've made some chords that are catchy? You know, so so I think I, I, it's I, I want to be a bit hesitant because uh, the Holy Spirit is beyond our control, and so while yes, I'm not going to say that. I don't. Do you have any some, anything to add to that? I feel like I do. I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, I feel like I kind of almost want to say, what does that even feel like? Not because I'm questioning it, more than. You know, it's like I said, it's our feelings are so untrustworthy. We don't really, like I said, I'm in this concert. I'm sensing this incredible kind of moment, a connection with this band we were talking about before. Is it the Holy Spirit? Is it my feelings? 
I don't know. I really don't know. Like you said, it's more. I think I think it's very easy to get to a, pla a place to where we are trying to rationalize a feeling, especially as Christians. Like you're like especially the Christian music scene. It was really much about like trying to justify what we're doing. And so many Christians from the Christian music scene these days have left completely left Christianity altogether, like a scorched earth policy leaving it. Yeah, yeah. And we I've watched this a lot of our contemporaries. You know, uh, in our band. We've been fortunate that the five guys that are a part of it, all of us are still active in church in some way. Um, and that's super unusual, not, not to mention having three priests. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, let's enjoy music. Let's not idolize it. Let's not try to pin things on the Holy Spirit and say, well, it must be the Holy Spirit making this happen and justify it. But also, too, let's not become hyper-dependent on feeling things. When people come to, like, our services... Sometimes you're going to really love being in the service, like going to, a, you know, something. Oftentimes you come in and you're just tired, you know, but the service still happens. You still participate in the sacramental reality of this. It's not dependent on how I feel. Like, I, oh, I'm feeling particularly great coming to the service this morning. Didn't matter. The liturgy happened. God was glorified. We were obedient. We were um, happy to be there in a general sense. Um, beyond that, you know, I don't know. And I think that that's the reality is, as Christians, we know there are sure and certain conduits of God's grace, right? The sacraments, uh, you know, worship, scripture, these, these things are, but God's certainly not limited to those things, but those are the things we can say yes. So uh, if you ask me, is the Holy Spirit involved in the sacraments? I can hold out and say yes. Is the Holy Spirit involved in the Taylor Swift concert? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> in, in, some, in some way. You know, I love that I've mentioned yeah. Taylor Swift twice. That's right. Punk, punk. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. We're going for Beyonce. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Well, was there a moment when you said, I'm going to put down my bass and or your guitar? Yeah. I'm going to put down my guitar and I'm going to become a priest. I think the day before my ordination. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, for myself. For me, it, it came down to 2009. I went to seminary in 2009. I, I went to uh, school at St. Vladimir's um, Orthodox Theological Seminary outside of New York City. I, um, I'll, if you don't care, I'll say a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yep. Um, I didn't have, again, I never wanted to be a pastor. My dad was a pastor. I saw what that was like, and I said it a thousand times. I will never do that. Never, never, never. <laughs> <laughs> and I meant it when I said it. Um, when... 2008 rolled around and the, the financial crisis hit. My brother was a mortgage broker, a good one, like the one who would tell people, you don't want this mortgage, don't do it, you know? And um, his company was, um, was one of the first to, to go under in all of this. And so he started thinking about seminary. And he said, he said, I want you to go to seminary with me. I said, I'm building furniture, I'm in a band. I have no desire to go to seminary. What are you talking about? And he kept doing it. He kept doing it. He kept bugging me. And he said, let's just go visit the seminary together. So my wife and I were like, cool, a trip to New York, let's do it. So we went, and I was like, and I was having a hard time at work at this time, but I, we went, and after like a day of being there, I was like, man, I wanna, I wanna do this, this looks like fun. <laughs> my wife was like, what are you talking about? So we applied and I went. But the, I played my last show, real show, I would say, like, what was it, like a week before we moved to the seminary, in the hall of our church, which was super weird. Like, you don't do that in an Orthodox church. But my priest was like, well, we're saying we come in, people come, and, <laughs> and uh, it was weird. Yeah. It was super weird for us. In fact, Father Chris Foley was yeah. really mad about it. He's like, hey, what are you doing this in church? <laughs> really funny. That was awesome. He's in the band too. He's yeah. in the band too. <laughs> <laughs> so to answer your question, I I didn't have any plans to do it. I went to seminary not knowing if I was going to be ordained. It was a risk for me personally. But when I went, I gave away a lot of stuff because I knew I thought this is this is it, <clears throat> and I think that was that was right to do for me. Um, I gave away some of my favorite guitars and stuff like that. I kept a couple. Um, but when I got out and I had given these things up, God saw fit in a way to sort of give some of this back. I didn't want it back, um, but then I got it back and it was a way of God, I think it was a way, it was a way of him saying, there's still things here to, to explore for your salvation. And truthfully, we're recording an album right now, which is, it's an awful experience, actually. Working with a band. I it is awful. It it's actually awful. is awful. It's awful. Yeah. <laughs> we love them. It's, this, it's the worst marriage in the world yep. to four other men. I mean, yeah. it's <laughs> messy. It to begin with. It's, it's the worst. Again, it's, it's the best. Um, so I'm grateful that God has, in some ways, put this back in my lap to work through. But 
but I didn't know what was going to happen. So for me, it was like, I'm giving these things up, we'll just trust God to see where he leads. So for me, it kind of ended up at a point where, you know, they said to me, your ordination material, you're not that messed up. You know, we think we can make a, a priest out of you. You know, do you want to do it? And I, I said, I'll, I'll do this. This will be, and then I thought, oh, this will be great. And then I became a priest and I was like, wow, this is way harder than I ever thought. <laughs> yeah. Well, my, my answer is, is connected to St. John's. Um, so, uh, so, the, so I, here's, I'll try to figure out where to start this story. So at, uh, in 2016, I was about to tell the band, uh, I'm going to start seminary training, and, but I'm going to do it re remote, and I'll only need to be gone you know, four weeks a year, so we can still tour, but we'll just have to black out those weeks. And right as that was happening, our singer decided he wanted to start a solo at career. And so, uh, so the band went on hold, and I said, OK, God, sounds good. <laughs> I guess I have more time for seminary now. Okay. Um, so I started that. Um, that, you know, that was three years. Eventually, uh, we moved to Montreal. I, you know, I got into an ordination process uh, there. Uh, and the band in 2019 this was starting back up, and we were about, we made an album in 2019. Uh, I knew, I, they knew that I was going to seminary. They knew like, that I had a sense of calling to the priesthood. Um, but there was no clear path at that point. It was still getting figured out. So you know, we, we made an album, and we, we'd been gone for three years. We were about to come back on tour. Uh, you know, the tour had happened. Uh, it was, was booked for March 2020. Uh, we had an album was going to drop. It was a good album. Uh, the tour was pretty sold out. We played uh, San Francisco on March 12th, 2020. Oh, and, uh, and then the world shut down, oh, right? Yeah. You know, And so um, already I knew I was, I was on a, a trajectory. And so I, I, I was finding ways of balancing the reality that I was uh, in an ordination process. I was, uh, knew I, I wanted to be a priest. I had a sense that God wanted me to be a priest. But I also figured this is a good thing, and I love it. So I also want to do this while I can. So to me, it was, it's, it, the question is a sort of question of the hierarchy of goods, right? So it's not that the band was bad, and I was leaving that behind, and I want to do something good, <coughs> which is being a priest. It's that the band was good, and being a priest, I think, is what, is what God wants me to do. And that's good, too. So where, how does this work out? So uh, anyways... Uh, COVID offered a lot of thinking time um, and <laughs> a lot of less touring than I had planned. Uh, but we eventually, uh, so let's see, that was 2020. In, so about the same time, the following year, I was ordained a deacon uh, in Florida, and sort of still in the sort of middle of COVID. Uh, and then, and then uh, the band was finally getting back and doing some stuff in, in, the, in the summer of 2021, I guess. Um, at that same time, I also came here to interview uh, and, and was looking into this uh, possibility and, and seeing if God was calling us here. So uh, after that, uh, we went and we made another album, which was miserable. It was the worst <laughs> one. They're always a little miserable, like he said, because it's just a lot of, a lot of ideas. Ugh. It's expensive every day. You're like, what are we doing? Uh, and so anyways, it, we were recording in, in, in Vermont, and... Uh, and it was beautiful, and it was miserable, and um, and I had been offered the position here, and and I hadn't told the band yet, and so I was trying to figure out how do I, like I knew that part of me was going to sort of die, right? Like I, I was no longer, though this was a good thing, this was going to have to fade away, and not in the sense eventually, uh, you know, I I still play music, so it's not that it completely has to go away, but it's no longer going to be my main thing. I remember walking around the studio just in sort of, uh, in a bit of grief and sadness and like how do I tell these people who've been a part of my life for 18 years that, you know, it's, going it's not gonna be the same <laughs> thing. And so it was hard, it was really a, a challenge, it was sort of sad, but it also was exactly what God was calling me to and it wasn't a surprise to them, they knew it, you know? And so, so to me it was, it was a matter of sort of slowly God reordering the hierarchy of goods in my life and and I still love music, and, I, and technically, and so I told them, I said, guys, I'm taking this position, <laughs> and I'm going to move to Savannah, and I'm not going to be able to tour next year, and, and, and I said, and if you need to kick me out, that's okay, and they said, no, we're not going to kick you out, just we'll get someone to fill in, and then they did one tour without me, and now they're on a break again, so, <laughs> it's all good. so yeah, so it's, uh, timing's everything, timing's everything, yeah, <laughs> but it, God, God has his ways, yeah, that's awesome, yeah, that's awesome. I like so your decision. 
<laughs> it's connected, I guess. It's all connected. Yeah. It's like one of those mind maps. <laughs> yes. I can. Um, it was kind of a dumb accident. So what happened was we were at Cornerstone in 1995. We had just come out with our first record, our first proper record. Um, we were super excited to play there because it was it was the first step for one thing to get beyond the Christian scene mm -hmm. in the Christian scene. So we're playing <laughs> a big crowd. We were tired. Uh, the show didn't go exactly according to plan. Some of it's in the video. Um, Everybody loved it. We weren't in love with it. Uh, that night, we were tired. We were staying, you know, you're in a punk band, so we're all trying to stay in one room at a, at a university. They were, they were using their, like, renting out their dorm room. In the middle of the night, knock, knock, knock. The RA was knocking on the door saying, there's too many of you in the room. I'm like, what are you talking about? There's too many of you in the room. You guys, so, like, halfway through the night, we weren't sleeping. So the next day, we got up early. We had to head back. This is Illinois. We're driving back to Georgia. We all had work the next day. And the only guy who could drive was our manager, who was the youngest one of our bunch, who we were getting ready to let go, because he was kind of, at the time, he was kind of annoying. Um, and, but the situation was such that he had to drive the van, and he was not a good driver. He was an Atlanta driver. Is anybody from Atlanta? <laughs> what, what do like, they do? What, what, Atlanta when it snows driver? Or? <laughs> Atlanta any time driver. Like, what, what do they do to those people? Anyway, he was a terrible driver. We love Reed. I mean, we, we get along with him now. Um, but at the time, things were not so great with him. And he was tired on top of this. It was, it was a weird time for the band. So we're driving home. We're on uh, Interstate 57, and he just lost control of the van. He started fishtailing. We had a big, one of those big, long, huge, what was it, 17-passenger vans, full of gear in the back end. We had another car following us that was with the rest of the, the folks. There's seven of us in the van with all the gear. And he just lost control, and he rolled the van across the highway three times. Um, in the process, the singer from the other band, there's two of us that were two bands together. We always we always hung out with this other band called Built Down Man, they were playing for us. In fact, the guy who makes the movie was from that band originally. The singer from that band, um, Gabriel Aldrich, who was just ordained to the priesthood this year, um, he was thrown out and flew 30 feet in the air, landed on the ground, unconscious, broke his neck. Um, my brother was crushed under the van, we had to pull him out of under the van. Our drummer broke his neck. The driver, Reed, broke his neck. Um, and the rest of us were just tossed around in there. So I just remember, as the van was going over, was it was, as, as Alex says in the movie, it's like being a hamster in a hamster wheel. You know, you just, yeah. No, he talks about being a towel in a dryer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the sensation. You're just bouncing around inside of this van. So we got to the wreck. Um, I, I was the only one not really, at least at the moment, they knew was not seriously injured. So once we were able to get my, extract my brother from under the van, um, we got everybody into ambulances, and I, I had asked to ride in the ambulance to go, so I went with my brother. And they were cutting his clothes off as they do after an accident. Because I'm sitting here in the front of the van thinking, it's gonna be okay, everybody's just banged up, it's gonna be all right, we get back going home, things are gonna be fine. And I look back at my brother, and I could just see his body was just crushed, it was crushed. So um, he and we were at a Champaign, Urbana in Illinois at a hospital there for, um, what was it, three weeks maybe? Something like that, two or three weeks, something like that. Um, while, he, while they were working on him. He went through five surgeries over time. Uh, he was very close to dying. He punctured both lungs, bladder burst, his pelvis was crushed. The drummer, like I said, three other people were injured pretty seriously, but not life-threatening seriously, but seriously enough, broken necks. So a lot of surgeries going on there. But really incredibly, and my brother was really, really, really messed up. His body was severely messed up. And that was a turning point for him spiritually. So for him, his orthodoxy, his Christianity, which had been very much sort of backseat there, present, you know, part, moved right to the front. Because suddenly it was like, Here, here's my life. I won't live forever. What am I going to do with what's left? Uh, so for him, he came through that. He credits the Lord with miraculously healing his body in a number of ways. Um, and it really, really was the case. So when we came out of that, I mean, orthodoxy, at least for, for Father Chris and my brother, their, their life became much more centered on the church. So if you look at it, if you were to listen to our records, the themes change radically once you get past that wreck. Um, and that's really, my brother was just, he just wasn't, 
He grew up in a Christian family. He just wasn't that concerned about his faith. He was very cynical about it. But the wreck happened, and everything changed. And when I watched him grow in that, I became very convinced of what, whatever he's doing, I want a part of that. So does that help? Does that answer that? I think we have time for one last question. Yes, Tim. Um, I spent a, a big part of my life involved in rock and roll, and um, I was very huge in it in the 80s when the Sex Pistols came out, oh, yeah. and the Clash, and that crowd. And I was stuff. lucky that um, I was got up, up close, here up close, and got to know some of the great songwriters of, of our generation. And listening to, to those songwriters, I'm glad you mentioned this, if I could say a word about it. Because I was thinking about this yesterday, this exact thing. And the thought that came to my mind was that when you truly become a Christian, when you truly enter into Christ, the reality of Christ is joy. So we're called to rejoice, and it kills punk rock. I mean, it just destroys it. So what you're left with is how do we take this joy, how do we rejoice in such a way um, that, you know, if we're going to write this way, what's going to come from this? Maybe, maybe Ska would be part of it. <laughs> but, but, but the point of it would be, like, I mean, you're right. You know, I think about it, yeah. it the angst goes out the window when you have Christ. The, the, the angst is what's generating power for so many of those bands. You mentioned, we were talking about Fugazi. Like, there's so much anger in that band, and it's like they have to, like, pump up the anger machine to make things really work. And when you start to see that, it's like, this is, it's like you can listen to it, you can appreciate it. That wouldn't be so much transcendent. It'd be more like, is this really something in the long run I really have the energy to kind of delve into. Does this reflect what I, what I you know, experience about Christ and myself? And I mean, you can still, I still listen to that stuff and you know, rah, 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 I listen to the car, I love to crank it up as loud as the stereo will go. But it doesn't meet the need of the soul, I think, anymore. It met the needs of the emotion. And so, I mean, I, don't, I actually don't, don't disagree. I mean, what do we do, what do, we do with that? I mean, these, these things don't really have a place. They lose, they, sometimes we have to give it up. In the sense, they just lose their place in our life. They just don't have room for that anymore. So, you know, there's no real old punk rock musicians. I mean, unless they're really bitter. Most of them are dead. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> seriously, seriously. I would say that's the thing about a song, is that a song doesn't have to encapsulate every feeling, every aspect of life, right? If you only listen to one song your whole life, you're sort of an impoverished listener, right? So. So but there might be a time where a Sex Pistols song is meeting the exact m emotional, mental needs you're feeling at that moment, you know? And, that's, and in that sense, it's a gift, right? Uh, there, can be, there can be a sort of release and a, and a healing aspect even to very heavy, loud music, I think. That said, uh, you know, there's more to say about life than just that frustration or that one, you know, uh, anger. So, I mean, that's why we have our book here, too. There you so, go. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I want to keep talking. We're going to keep talking, but not on microphones anymore. So, a um, uh, couple quick things. Um, so, we, uh, first off, let's give a hand for Father James. Thank you for coming. <laughs> you all for being here. Um, so this is the second of, I think, seven of these that we're having. Uh, the next one is going to be Harrison Scott Key. I see him in the audience. Uh, he is a local uh, author, and he's going to be speaking on the topic, Love is a Joke. He's re recently written a book um, about his own marriage uh, that's, that is an incredibly funny and heartfelt and, and, and serious book uh, that's sort of pierced through with God's grace in an amazing way. 
So uh, it's going to be an amazing time. And I'd RSVP early to that because he's from Savannah, and I, and I think it's, you know, space is going to fill up quick. So please uh, do come out for that. Bring your friends. Um, in the meantime, uh, there's food left. Please eat. Stuff, just pockets full of food if you want. And there's maybe some wine left over too. So thank you all for coming. God bless, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.